Hello everybody. Welcome to Da Vinci Academy's Chapter 3 section of Thorax. This is the last lecture in this unit, our Lecture 17 on the breasts. So the breasts are very unique structures that are located in the anterior chest wall. They are composed of glandular tissue, which helps with the production of milk, as well as fibrous fatty adipose tissue, which helps with support. The breasts receive a very dense neurovascular supply from the subclavian artery via the IMA, the internal mammary artery, as well as the abdominal aorta via the intercostal arteries. The breasts also receive a very dense network of innervation from the intercostal nerves as well as the supraclavicular nerves. The breasts are often viewed as a very important topic today, especially when dealing with certain breast malignancies, breast cancers, and other breast conditions. However, it's also important for psychological reasons, including maternal infant bonding during breastfeeding. So the breasts, interestingly enough, are actually embryologically derived from ectodermal or skin cells and modified from sweat glands to help produce the production of milk. The breast tissue actually derives along what is called the embryological mammary ridge or the mammary line that actually extends from the axilla down into the pubic area. In other subhuman animals, such as dogs, they will actually have nipples in multiple different locations along this mammary ridge, and humans in certain conditions can actually have an accessory nipple and breasts anywhere along this line. So the breasts are very unique structures, as we mentioned, that are located superficially along the anterior chest. They are located above the pectoralis minor and above the pectoralis major. The breast spans from the ribs 2 down to the ribs 6, and the medial border is the sternum, and the lateral border is considered to be the mid-axillary line. The breast is commonly divided into four different quadrants, the upper right, the upper left, the lower right, and the lower left, with the axillary tail reaching up into the armpit. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss the different components of the breast. So the first one is the nipple. So the nipple is a very central raised portion. It usually is the point of most maximal projection on the breast. And this is where it has many tiny holes where milk is actually secreted. Interestingly enough, the nipple areolar complex is actually located at the T4 dermatome, which is often tested. Underneath the nipple is a structure called the ampulla. The ampulla is this dilated sac right above the nipple itself that is where milk is actually housed prior to secretion. The areola is a pigmented location that circumferentially surrounds the nipple and can vary in size, shape, and pigmentation based on the gender and the ethnicity of the individual. The axillary tail dispense, as we mentioned before, is an extension of the mammary glands that extend into the axilla so deeper into the breast, there are other additional structures, such as the suspensory ligament of Cooper. This ligament of Cooper is what helps keep the breast vertical and helps keep the breast lifted against gravity. The suspensory ligament of Cooper actually extends from the dermis to the deep layer of the superficial fascia of the pectoralis major. What interestingly enough happens is as age or with cancer, these ligaments may actually become disrupted and actually break down which actually caused the breast to actually sag, called ptosis, or could actually have the skin start to dimple, especially in malignant situations. So as we mentioned before, the breast is full of a lot of fatty tissue, which is this yellow structure here, and this it provides a significant amount of the breast stroma, which is the, pretty much the structural component of the breast. It surrounds the lactiferous producing ducts. There's also a space right behind the breast glands and the breast fatty tissue called the retromammary space, and this sits between the fatty tissue and the pectoralis major, and this is where you can actually dissect this plane out, and what oftentimes is used to implant sort of breast implantation. In terms of the functional unit of the breast, or the parenchyma of the breast, it's divided into the lobules as well as the ducts. The lobules are where the milk is produced. It is produced by the luminal cell layer, and then it's excreted into the ductal system. The ductal system drains these lobules and is lined by myoepithelial cells, that help with contraction to secrete and propel the milk towards the ampulla and eventually into the nipple. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss the blood supply to the breast. So as I mentioned before, the blood to the breast is very dense and it is rich and supplied by many different structures. Most notably, the blood comes off of the subclavian artery as well as the aorta. The subclavian artery provides blood via the internal thoracic or the internal mammary artery and it has numerous perforating branches that branch both, both laterally into each breast. It provides majority of the blood to the medial portion of the breast. The lateral thoracic artery branches off more of a superior lateral projection and it provides blood to the lateral breast tissue. The intracostal arteries provide blood via the lateral mammary branches. They come off of the aorta 
and provide blood to the posterior lateral region of the breast. And then you have the thoracocromial trunk, which is a minor contributor and provides blood via the pectoral branches as they provide blood to the pectoralis major and minor. And in terms of the venous drainage of the blood, the venous drainage pretty much parallels a lot of these arterial vessels. The breasts are highly innervated structures. They are innervated from the second through sixth intercostal nerves as well as the supraclavicular nerves. The breasts have a very dense network of innervation, especially for sensation. In certain instances where surgery is required on the breasts, the nerves are actually at high risk for atrogenic injury, especially when doing things such as circumferential incisions around the breast tissue, around the nipple, or if there's any sort of breast excision that's required for lumpectomies or mastectomies or fat necrosis that's associated with trauma, this can all affect the sensory component of the breast. The lymphatic drainage of the breast is also important, especially when discussing malignancies. The breast drainage is important because certain cancers, especially being carcinomas of the breast, both ductal and lobular, can usually drain through the lymphatic system into the axillary lymph nodes and is important for clinical diagnoses. So the lymph nodes for the breast are mostly composed of the axillary nodes as well as the parasternal or intrathoracic nodes. The axillary nodes are the most common site of drainage and is useful in sentinel lymph node biopsies, especially when you're trying to investigate the extent that cancer cells have migrated. The parasternal or intrathoracic nodes lie adjacent to the internal thoracic artery and are actually located along the sternum and provide an avenue in which blood and possible malignancies can travel from one breast across to the other. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss breast conditions. First we're going to go ahead and discuss benign breast conditions. The first one being mastitis which is an inflammation of the breast tissue and it can be acute and it can be caused by bacterial infection and most likely a staph. It commonly presents in women who are breastfeeding or who recently gave birth and their child is still breastfeeding. As the child continues to feed, the infant will cause microfractures in the nipple areola or complex, allowing for the infant's normal oral flora to enter into these microcracks and actually proliferate bacteria. Another type of mastitis is called periductal or subareolar mastitis, where it forms an abscess. And this is occurs when abscesses actually arise in the subcutaneous fat of the breast, not necessarily in the microcracks or the duct itself. This most likely for some reason has a propensity to occur in smokers. So oftentimes if you have someone with an extensive smoking history and is not actively breastfeeding and they still have signs and symptoms of mastitis, think of a periductal abscess or subareolar abscess. Other benign breast conditions to note are things such as fibrocystic changes as we'll discuss, as well as mammary duct ectasia, which is just dilation or overdilation of the subareolar ducts. So with fibrocystic breast changes, this is non-cancerous breast lumps that often feel like a bumpy road or cobblestones that is often used in the clinical description. It usually presents with occasional pain in premenopausal women that actually will increase in size and decrease size based on the hormonal surges during the menstrual cycle. Another benign breast condition that's often confused with fibrocystic changes are fibroadenomas. These fibroadenomas are actually developed from fibrous tissue in the breast that stems from the lobules themselves. They grow and they envelop the lobules in the strum of the breast and they often create a palpable lump, but not necessarily a cobblestone appearance. They are highly mobile, they're firm, and they're painless lumps that are difficult to distinguish from the breast cancer without proper imaging. But the big difference between the two is that this one has some pain and this one is usually painless. This also presents in premenopausal women, but can also present in postmenopausal women. Other breast conditions, benign breast conditions to discuss, are breast cysts. So these are just fluid-filled little cysts that are sometimes painful in the mobile sacs that are often detected in ultrasound, and they often can enlarge due to hormonal surges or hormonal changes, and oftentimes aspiration of these cysts is all that's needed to, to alleviate these symptoms. Another benign breast condition is called intraductal papilloma, in which you actually have a little papilloma, a microscopic proliferation of cells that will actually grow inside the lining of the ducts of the breast that can actually cause some sort of obstruction and potentially even a discharge. And most notable is that if you have someone with a bloody discharge and they have no signs or indication they have malignancies in the breast, then you're most likely going to think introductal papilloma. So when you hear blood discharge and you don't think malignancy, think pap introductal papilloma. Mammary duct ectasia is where you just have an overdilation of the normal ducts themselves. You could have substances like the milk or colostrum, which is the early milk produced during breastfeeding, or any sort of lactiferous discharge can actually clog these ducts and cause this dilation of the ductal system. This can present with sort of different skin changes, some tenderness, or even some discharge, and most notably is this greenish discharge. So if you have a green discharge, then you think mammary 
duct ectasia. If you think blood and it's not malignant, think intraductal papilloma. If you see an ultrasound and you see a cyst or fluid-filled cavity and it's not malignant or there's no indication of malignancy, just think of a normal cyst that can be aspirated. So now we're going to go ahead and discuss more of the malignant side of the breast conditions. So breast condition is so important today, especially because it's the most common cause of cancer in women as the second most common cause of mortality in women. Most notably, everyone talks about the BRCA1 and the BRCA2, which are these DNA tumor suppressor genes. And of course, they do have an increased risk of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So a lot of individuals today are getting prophylactic mastectomies, but oftentimes not all of breast cancers are actually related to this, this gene. But however, in certain situations, especially of a very unique cl clinical vignette or a clinical situation where a man comes in and he's suspecting that he has breast cancer, BRCA2 is usually a high clinical suspicion. So the two types of breast cancers that we're going to discuss are ductal carcinoma and lobular carcinoma. So in terms of ductal carcinoma, it could either be in situ, which is where it kind of stays put, it does not move. And then you have invasive, and this is where it breaks through the basement membrane and has a propensity to migrate. Now with ductal carcinoma, this is a cancer within these ducts themselves. This one presents usually with no palpable mass and no penetration of the underlying structure. It also has the cells grow in these ductal systems and can eventually obstruct the duct producing what is called tenderness or even bloody discharge. And this is where you might get confused between intraductal papillomas. And interestingly, these can often present with calcifications which are picked up on mammography. So now if the ductal carcinoma is actually worse and to a certain extent to become invasive, and this happens when the breast will actually break through that basement membrane and invade into other breast areas, other breast tissues, and even the lymphatics. This often presents with a palpable mass as well as skin dimpling. So this one usually does not have a mass felt, no mass, and this one usually does have a mass. And what's interesting enough is that you can palpate for these lesions on a two centimeters, but anything smaller than two centimeters usually has to get picked up on mammography. There's also four different types of invasive ductal carcinoma that we'll discuss now. So the four types of invasive ductal carcinoma, you have tubular carcinoma, in which you have pretty much cancer or tumor, tumor proliferation of the myoepithelial cells that are helped with the contractile force of the milk. You have mucin carcinoma that produces a bunch of mucus, which is also present in women usually 70 years or older. You have medullary carcinoma, which is usually associated with BRCA1. It's well circumscribed, so it's well delineated on the breast. And it's often mistaken for fibroadenoma on, on mammography. Then the worst one of all is inflammatory carcinoma with the worst prognosis. And this one is often confused with mastitis because it will prevent present with that inflammatory response, a very reddened breast that's very tender. It can be mistaken for that acute mastitis. But the difference is, is these individuals who usually not have breastfed recently or not have given birth recently. This one is important to note because it actually causes a blockage of the lymphatics. This blockage of the lymphatics is what they call pewter orange, or it causes an orange-like skin like of the breast where you get sort of a, a similar orange rind kind of presentation. So now we're going to discuss lobular carcinoma. So lobular carcinoma, this is where you actually have breast cancer proliferating in the lobules themselves rather than the ducts. And just like, the, just like it was with ductal carcinoma, you have in situ as well as invasive. In situ, lobular carcinoma is confined to just the lobules, and it presents with a single file pattern on histology. This is because of a loss of E cadherin adhesion protein. This E cadherin protein is what adheres the different cells together and keeps them nice and contained. When this protein is no longer being expressed, these cells will actually end up sort of migrating or kind of having this single file pattern. Interestingly enough, E cadhering, this is calcium dependent process the calcium D dependent, that's how I remember this. And it's often tested upon is what do these proteins require? They're calcium dependent adhesion proteins. This one also does not have a mass, but it can present bilaterally, which is why if you have high clinical suspicion for lobular carcinoma, make sure you check both breasts. And again, no calcification. Lobular carcinoma invasive is also very poor prognosis. And this also has a single file pattern based on the same histological makeup with loss of adhering protein. So treatment of breast cancer is very complex and it's probably outside the scope of this unit, but we're going to touch on it in a little bit. So in determining what's going on with the breast tissue, first you have to figure out, is this benign or is this malignant? Once you figure out that this is malignant, you have to start to figure out, okay, what kind of breast cancer are we working with? So figure out, is this lobular or is this ductal? Then you have to figure out, was this sort of a invasive or is this an in situ? 
Once you figure out that, you want to kind of hone down on the size and location of this mass and see if it's spread over to the other breast or if it's spread into the lymph nodes or into any distant sites, including the, the lungs, bones, or brain. So once you've kind of figured out the type of breast cancer, you figured out if it's invasive or in situ, you figured out where it's located in the breast, the size of the, t the tumor in the breast, and you figure out if it's spread or not, you can then take all this information and move over to different types of treatments. So the most conservative now being lumpectomies, where you can actually just remove that little isolated portion of cancer, and then hopefully with some sort of treatment like radiation or chemotherapy, you can try to manage it that way. If you have any sort of clinical suspicion that it may have spread, you have to do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is where you inject dye into the breast and you watch as the dye will actually spread through the lymphatic system and you can then see that it's spread to which row of the breast. So when you look at the axillary lymph nodes, there'll be actually certain rows of lymph nodes. And depending on where the coloration or the dye has spread, you can kind of figure out, well, how far up into the axillary lymph nodes it's spread and has it actually gone systemically. Kind of along the lines of a sentinel lymph node biopsy is actually lymph node dissection. So you can biopsy these lymph nodes and see where they are along this line. Then you can also do an actual lymph node dissection where you kind of remove and bulk all these lymph nodes to help with staging and help with trying to figure out the actual prognosis of the cancer itself. Once all this happens and say that it's not a, you're not a candidate for lumpectomy and it's probably better to do a mastectomy to kind of get rid of the cancer in, in its entirety, there's actually different types of mastectomy options. You can do a simple mastectomy where you just remove the breast tissue. You can do a modified radical, which is a little more invasive, in which you remove the breast tissue, the axillary fat, and the axillary lymph nodes. You can do a complete radical mastectomy where you remove everything, including the breast, the fat, the lymph nodes, and even the pec major and pec minor. It used to be pretty popular in the 20th century when they were breast cancer procedures are kind of trying to figure out what works. But today with the modified radical or even the simple or even lumpectomies, satisfactory results can be obtained. And then if individuals have more of a manageable kind of breast cancer and they want to have some sort of breast reconstruction afterwards, then you can kind of in, in entertain the idea of possibly pursuing a skin sparing mastectomy or a nipple sparing mastectomy. And the purpose of doing a skin sparing or a nipple sparing mastectomy is that it spares the skin and it spares the nipple so that you can have an effective reconstruction for the breast. However, if you have Paget's disease or Paget's cancer, Paget's disease of the nipple or the breast, then you are no longer a candidate for this because the nipple and the skin has actually become involved with the cancerous process. So now we're going to discuss a few clinical pearls. So again, as we mentioned before, you have the mammillary nipples and the mammillary ridge that extends from the axilla down to the pubic symphysis. And in certain situations, it's pretty normal, especially in subhuman animals like dogs and cats. However, in certain humans, you could actually have these accessory nipples and these nipple complexes that can actually present in, in pubertal females and they can have a pigmented little nodular or mass anywhere along this ridge. And you may often think, well, I have a little bit of mole anywhere along here. But then during the menstrual cycle, these little ridges or these little bumps that you think are moles can actually become inflamed or large or tender. And then usually it's pretty benign, but you can actually have these removed and cut out. But it's interesting enough that you can actually have these sort of ectopic accessory nipple area or complexes. What's also another important discussion to have is fat tissue necrosis. So fat tissue necrosis is pretty much can happen anywhere in which there's fat, whether it's in the breast, which is a common site, or the pancreas, which also has a lot of fatty tissue. Whenever the blood is compromised to this region, the adipose tissue can die. And when the tissue starts to die, it can produce oily secretions. It can form a little seroma, which is a fluid pocketing underneath the skin. You can get a sinus tract forming that can actually drain these fluid. And you can also increase the potential for an infection in the breast or skin. Certain breast procedures are actually highly predisposed an individual to breast tissue necrosis, such as things like mastectomy or mastopexy or even reduction mammoplasties, and sometimes even breast augmentation when there's excessive manipulation of the fatty tissue. So we're also going to discuss in brief just breast augmentations, just because of the fact that they are considered to be the most common sort of cosmetic procedure to date. As I mentioned before, you have the retromammary space right here, which is right after the fatty tissue and right before the pectoralis major. And this is where you can insert a subglandular implant. You also have a submuscular implant where you can insert underneath the pectoralis major, as well as you can do a biplane implant that kind of uses the pectoralis major muscle as well as the serratus anterior fascia to produce a sort of nice inferior lateral sling to keep the breast implant in place. Which interestingly enough to note, especially in sort of malignancies and talking about breast cancer, it's the subglandular implants that are often very difficult to assess for cancers and mammography due to its close proximity to the breast tissue and can sometimes obscure the findings that you would expect on breast cancer. 
The last thing to talk about, especially as we discuss so much cancer in this unit, is the way in which cancer spreads. So carcinoma usually spreads via the lymphatic system, and sarcoma is usually spread via the hematogenous system. So I used this little mnemonic when I was taking my tests in step one and other associated examinations that hematogenous spreading cancer runs fast. So hematogenous, H for hepatocellular carcinoma, liver cancer, um, sarcomas, again, sarcoma spread via the blood, cancer, corneal carcinoma will spread via the blood, runs for renal cell carcinoma, and fast for follicular carcinoma of the thyroid. So these carcinomas are all unique in that they spread via the blood. And then again, if you have trouble remembering sarcomas are for blood, carcinomas for lymphatics, I remember that sarcomas begins with the letter S. And in Latin, sanguis is the word for blood, and that is how I remembered it. S for sanguis, so sarcoma spread via the blood. And that concludes our section here on the breast. Thank you.